All right, hi everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. It's so great to see you all here today. Um, I am Dr. Katie Martin. I'm a member of the Mini PCR Bio team. Uh, my own background is in science. I have a PhD in neuroscience, and I also taught high school for a few years after graduating, but before joining the Mini PCR team. Um, I'm delighted to be joining you today for one of our Monday afternoon series of webinars. Um, this is a webinar that we a webinar series that we kicked off when the pandemic set in. Um, we are up in the Boston area. Many of us are stuck at home, and so we kind of initiated these to stay in touch with you guys um, as we're all kind of uh, quarantining to various degrees and uh, share with you some of the resources that, that might hopefully be useful as you're navigating virtual learning. Um, I'm joined today by a couple of my colleagues from the mini PCR team. They are hanging out in the chat section to the side of the screen. If you have any questions as we're going along, uh, please feel free to reach out to them and they will do their best to get you answers. Um, I'm really delighted to be sharing our viral diagnostics lab with you today. This is a brand new lab yet to be released. It's going to be released this fall. Um, and so today is really a sneak peek at what we have in store for you in this lab. It's a first look behind the scenes at this lab, um, so you can get a, a sense of how your students might find it useful as they are learning molecular techniques. Um, the basic gist of this lab is that it's meant to illustrate the utility that molecular tools bring to outbreak management, to clinical diagnostics. Um, this lab is really rich in terms of the content you can cover with it, I think you'll find in our webinar today. But at the same time, the scenario is pretty simple. Technically, it's a pretty straightforward lab. Um, and so with a relatively low investment, you can cover a wide ground in terms of curriculum. And now what we're really trying to show with this lab is that um, if you're a clinician, molecular tools make your job a lot easier than it would otherwise be. If you're a healthcare provider, this is the scene that you might um, encounter every morning when you walk into your clinic. Your waiting room is full of patients. Um, they have distinct but overlapping sets of symptoms. Um, how do you know what pathogens they're infected with? And how do you know how to give them the best possible care? Um, this job would be a lot more difficult if it weren't for molecular tests. Molecular tests can lend a degree of certainty to diagnostics that wouldn't exist otherwise. And I think we've all seen this, you know, in our own context over the past few months in, in the case of the coronavirus outbreak. So if we look at a case like South Korea, this is a country that's done a really good job at managing its coronavirus outbreak. Um, in late February, early March, they had a really exponential takeoff in terms of their, their case numbers, but they were able to bring down their, their case number really quickly and maintain it at low levels even up through the past few weeks. And they were able to do that in part because they rolled out a really strong, really comprehensive testing program. They opened up within just a couple weeks of the virus's arrival on their shores. They opened up 600 clinics to test folks for coronavirus. Many of them are like pop-up labs, like the one you see in this photo that are just kind of tents that with clinics set inside. Um, South Korea also pioneered the use of drive-through testing facilities. So folks can drive in and in just 10 minutes, get their test done in a really safe, self-contained environment. And the data that these tests um, produced were really valuable. They helped uh, South South Korean doctors and public health officials know who to isolate, who to keep away from the rest of the human population, and who needed the most critical care. Now, in terms of coronavirus, even if our whole world at this point were to roll out a similarly comprehensive, similarly rigorous testing program, it's kind of too late for coronavirus. The genie is out of the bottle. Um, the virus has simply invaded the human population to too high a degree for us to contain it at this point using the measures that we have available. Um, and so in writing this lab, we decided not to set it, you know, in the present day, managing the coronavirus outbreak. We thought, look, we're going to be in this place again, you know, sooner rather than later. New diseases are emerging in the human population all the time. If you just look at the past, you know, few decades, we've seen the emergence of the Zika virus, of swine flu, of SARS, of MERS, of HIV AIDS. Um, and so inevitably, this will happen again soon. So we wanted to equip students with the tools they'll need to manage that when that day comes. And so our viral diagnostics lab is not about containing the coronavirus outbreak per se. Um, it's a, a fabricated scenario kind of set uh, in a hypothetical future where it's, it's the next pandemic that we're seeking to control. Um, this lab places students in the shoes of healthcare providers. So they are clinicians, they have four patients, and they need to diagnose these patients with one of two viruses. 
Their patients either have ordinary seasonal influenza, seasonal flu, which is no picnic, but um, it's also not an extreme emergency for most folks. It's fatal to just 0.1% of sufferers. And because a vaccine is available, uh, the, there's widespread immunity to seasonal flu each year. Our other possibility is much more unpleasant. It is our fictional novel influenza Q virus, or NICV. Now, while fictional, NICV is um, based on the emergence of the real-life influenza D virus, which was first detected in the human population in 2011. Um, so NICV is meant to kind of mirror cases that have emerged in the past. It's meant to be somewhat similar to the coronavirus as well. Because it's an emergent disease, there is no vaccine available for it. So there's no immunity to this disease in the human population. And that's really bad news because it's fatal to four to 8% of sufferers. So much higher fatality rate even than we're seeing with the coronavirus now. Now, despite their difference in severity, these two viruses are really similar in terms of the symptoms they manifest in a patient. This table kind of summarizes some of the common symptoms associated with seasonal flu and with our fictional NICV virus. And you can see both of them commonly cause fever, fatigue, and cough. And there are a couple other symptoms, aches and pains, stuffy nose, that are more typical for seasonal flu than NICV. But the basic point is if you're looking at a patient and they have some combination of these symptoms, it's going to be really hard to say for sure whether they have one virus or the other. Um, and that's really where we begin with this lab. Students are consulting with each of their four patients, learning about their symptoms, learning about their case histories, and they're going to see just how difficult it is to make a clear determination about what these patients are stricken with just from the information we have available about their symptoms. So let's um, see. I'll show you what this looks like. We'll step through one representative case. So our first patient today, patient DZ, she's a traveler. She's in the U.S. with her family on vacation from Australia. Shortly after she arrived in our country, um, she came down with fatigue, shortness of breath, and a cough. Um, when she showed up in your clinic today, she's running a fever. She has a 102 degree fever. And so she is showing all the symptoms that are common to both seasonal flu and NICV. Now, she did receive a seasonal flu shot, but she received it in Australia. Um, and the formulation of the flu shot is slightly different there than in North America. So it wouldn't necessarily provide her coverage if she were to encounter a seasonal flu strain in the U.S. And so because her case is so ambiguous, I, I'm starting to develop a hypothesis about what she might have, but I really couldn't narrow it down other than she might have seasonal flu or NICV. It's just too hard to tell. I need more information. I need the certainty that comes with doing a molecular test. And I think students will find this as they, they work the other cases. Some are easier than others, but they'll see just how much ambiguity there is unless you have a molecular test that you can turn to. And so part two of our lab, um, we're going to do just that. We're going to do a molecular test on each of our patients to get a more firm diagnosis for which disease they're stricken with. Um, specifically, we're going to be doing a PCR, or polymerase chain reaction test, to test for NICV and seasonal flu. You might be familiar with a PCR test. If you've received a coronavirus test yourself, um, you might have had a PCR test done. It's one of the more common types of tests we use to test for coronavirus. And the basic idea of a PCR test is that we are looking um, to detect genetic material from pathogens in human patients. So we're taking advantage of the fact that all biological entities, all um, living things have unique DNA sequences. And if we find the unique DNA sequence associated with a pathogen in a human subject, we can be pretty confident that human is infected with that pathogen. Now, PCR tests, um, they have many steps to them. This lab just focuses on one aspect of the PCR test workflow. We are going to be visualizing our test result. Um, and we'll be doing that live here today. I have some lab tools I'll, I'll demo for you. Um, note we will talk about the steps that lead up to the, the visualization piece we're doing today. Um, so conceptually we'll cover that, but in terms of hands-on stuff, we'll just be doing visualization with gel electrophoresis. Um, so I want to talk for a moment about gel electrophoresis and how we're using this technique today. So gel electrophoresis is a technique that we can use to separate DNA fragments based on their size. Um, we do this with something called using something called an agarose gel, which I have one I can show you. I'll make myself a little bigger. So this is an agarose gel. 
So it is made of agarose, which is a sugar that's been isolated from seaweed. And we call it a gel because it has this gelatinous texture. It's like firm jello. And our gel has these pockets, these wells across the top. That's where we're going to put our DNA samples. And we're going to coax that DNA to run through the body of a gel. Now, looking at this gel, to the naked eye, it looks perfectly smooth. But actually, if we had a microscope, we could see on the inside, it looks like this. It looks like a kitchen sponge. It's really porous on the inside. Um, and so when we make the DNA run through the body of the gel, um, different size fragments have an easier or harder time of doing so. So let's look at our gel another way. This is like an illustration of our gel turned on its side. The DNA wells now are on the left. And if we run an electric charge across this gel, we put the positive pole of the electrode at the foot of the gel, that positive charge is going to pull DNA towards it. DNA has negative charge. And so when we turn the machine on, the DNA is going to start migrating through. But you'll notice the larger fragments of DNA get hung up in the pores of the gel, whereas the smaller ones have an easier time of like wiggling through. Um, and so this is the principle of how a gel works. We're actually able to separate DNA molecules based on their sizes um, using this principle. And so once we've run our gel, what we see looks something like this. We see bands all throughout our gel. And these bands, each band corresponds to a group of DNA molecules all of the same size. Now, when we run a gel, we run it with a ladder. Um, a ladder is like a reference sample. We kind of use it like a yardstick. And in this particular ladder, we're using um, the, the particular ladder we're using today, the smallest size DNA fragment in that ladder is 100 base pairs in length. And this is the band that corresponds that, to that group of um, fragments. And then we have others of other sizes. And our job when we're using the gel is to run our unknown DNA samples out next to the ladder and then we compare them to the ladder to estimate their sizes. So that's a gel, a gel electrophoresis in a nutshell. I'm actually going to cast a gel that we'll use today in our lab live for you right now. Um, so let's, let's do that. Now, if you've learned gel electrophoresis already, you might have learned it the old-fashioned way that I learned it. You take your agarose. It has kind of the texture of like white sugar, sugar crystals. You measure it out with a scale, then you mix it with buffer. Um, we're going to make it a little easier on ourselves today. We're going to use gel green agarose tabs. Um, this is a mini PCR product. The basic idea is it's a tab of pre-measured agarose, and it's already mixed with buffer, and it's already mixed with DNA stain. So you simply need to add water to this pour your gel, and then that's it. Um, it saves you a little bit of time with the, the measurement steps. So let's see. Here is my gel green tab. I have it all set up in my, uh, my beaker here. And all I need to do is add water. I'm using a 2% gel for our experiment today. And so that means I need to add 20 milliliters of water to this tab. So I'm using this falcon tube, kind of like a graduated cylinder. There we go. So that looks about right. And you can see the tab like immediately starts to dissolve and break up. That's good. The ultimate goal is to dissolve all of the agarose crystals. Now we're ultimately going to need heat to break them up completely. If you were in my kitchen with me, you could look over my shoulder while I did this in a microwave or um, on my stovetop but we're not in my kitchen, so I'm gonna do this cooking show style. I actually already did this just before we started the webinar. I melted down another agarose tab over heat, and here it is. So this has been uh, kept warm on my bench, and so you can think of this as like, this is the before heat, this is the after heat. And you can see after heat, we've completely clarified that mixture. So we've dissolved all of our agarose crystals. That's the goal when we're melting down our agarose to make a gel. There's no set amount of time to heat it for. What you're really looking for is complete clarity, complete dissolution of the, those crystals. Now you will notice um, our mixture is orange-ish. That's because our gel green DNA stain that we're using, um, which is pre-mixed into the tab, it's got an orange cast to it. So this is exactly what we want to see. Okay, so now I'm going to pour my gel. Let's look at my bench top. So today I'm going to be using the Blue Gel electrophoresis system to run our gel. Blue Gel comes with this casting assembly. So this white tray is our casting mold. Um, I have this tray that sits inside it. I'm going to cast my gel right in that tray and then when it solidifies it transfers over to my electrophoresis chamber with the gel. 
And then I just need to add a comb to make sure I make wells for myself. I can either make a lot of smaller wells or a few bigger ones. It's much easier to load the bigger ones, so let's use that today. So with that assembly all set to go, I'm going to pour my melted agarose now in. And again, I'm using about 20 milliliters of melted agarose. That's enough to make one blue gel gel. And I can see, you can't see, but I can see my combs, the teeth of my comb um, are covered by a couple millimeters of gel, which is perfect. I'll like a couple millimeters deep to pipette my DNA into. So great, our gel now needs about 10 minutes to cool. Um, I am not gonna make you sit here and watch that gel cool with me to uh, kind of keep the webinar flowing. I'm gonna do this again cooking show style. I already cast this gel earlier. Let's just load and use this pre-cast agarose gel. So back to my bench top, putting my gel in my electrophoresis chamber. And then we run our gels in TBE buffer. So I'm about to cover my gel with 1x TBE. You need maybe like 25 to 30 milliliters of TBE to cover a typical blue gel. You just want enough to cover the gel by like one or two millimeters of liquid. That looks about good. Great. Okay. And then now we're ready to load our samples. So I'll show you what I'm about to do. So what I'm going to do is I have um, each of my samples in a tube that looks something like this. Um, I'm going to take a micropipette. This micropipette is going to measure me out uh, 10 microliters of whatever fluid I'm pipetting. So I've got a new tip. And I'm going to start with my DNA ladder, my reference sample. And I've got 10 microliters of that. You can kind of see the tip is purple. It's because there's a purple loading dye mixed in with this ladder. And I'm just going to eject that now into my gel. I'll start with the third well. It'll be easier for you to see. And there we go. So you can see how the third well is a little darker than the rest. Um, that means I was successful. So that's full now of that purple loading dye and the DNA ladder that accompanies it. And I'm just going to now load all of my patient samples into the wells to the right of my ladder. Now, for this lab, the patient samples that you'll receive, they also have been pre-mixed with loading dye, so you don't need to add that before running your gel. Um, you'll see a blue loading dye in this next sample. And that just makes it, again, a little bit easier, saves you a step. And that looks good. I'm changing the tip of my pipette between each of these just to make sure I'm not cross-contaminating. So that's happening off screen. Now, loading a gel is tricky if you've never done it before, but once you get the hang of it, it's nothing too, um, too scary. I think of it like playing operation. You want to take your pipette tip and just hover it just inside each well. What you want to avoid is going through the bottom or going through the side of your well. It's really easy to do that with a pipette tip. You don't feel it necessarily when it's happening, um, but it's really easy to kind of impale the side of your well and inject your sample like into the gel itself. You don't want to do that. If you do that, it will mess up your run. Um, now, if that happens to me today, I have extra wells. I'm only going to be using five of our nine wells, um, and so I can always try again in the one next door. But so far, so good. What I'm seeing right now, if you see how there are four wells that are darker than the others, those are the wells that have patient sample in them. If you see that nice rectangle of color of loading dye, that means you've done a good job. You haven't injected your sample you know, through the side of your well. So good, we are five for five. We are ready to run our gel. So I'm gonna put the lid on now and hit the power button. My light goes on, that's good. My gel is gonna run out now. Um, so I'm gonna give it a few minutes to run. And we can talk about some other stuff in the meantime. Now one thing to note is that we will be able to get our results before the end of the webinar today because we're using the blue gel to run our electrophoresis experiment. Um, blue gel is nice because it combines electrophoresis and visualization. It's like a blue light transilluminator sitting underneath a gel electrophoresis chamber. 
Um, so if you make your gel with a fluorescent green DNA dye the way that we did today using gel green, um, you'll be able to see your DNA bands as they're running out. It'll look something like this. Um, and so we'll actually be able to check back in on this gel in 15 or 20 minutes and we should see bands if, our, if we were successful in our experiment. So in the meantime though, I wanna kind of backtrack and talk a bit about viruses. Both of the samples that we are looking at, or both of the virus, the pathogens we're looking for today are viruses. Um, and so I wanna talk for a minute about what viruses are. They are really interesting biologically. And so let's um, take a few minutes to, to cover that. So viruses are really minimal in their construction. They are nothing more than a genome wrapped in a shell of some sort. That's it, that's all there is to it. Now the genome can be made of DNA or RNA. The shell is typically made of protein, and then sometimes there's an additional envelope around that protein shell that's made of like a cell membrane-like phospholipid um, structure. But that's really all there is to it. You're not going to find organelles in a virus particle. You're not going to find like free-floating enzymes and other proteins. Um, because they don't have that equipment, viruses can't make or use energy, right? They don't have mitochondria, they don't have chloroplasts, um, so they don't like eat food or, or use energy. They also can't reproduce themselves. They can't replicate themselves the way a living cell can. Um, for those reasons, many scientists would say viruses are not considered living. They're non-living biological entities. Um, they don't meet the minimum criteria necessary to be considered alive. Now, for any given living thing, walking, flying, swimming on the face of the earth, there is a virus to infect it. Viruses are very diverse. Um, there are viruses that are specialized just to infect bacteria, just to infect plants, and then just to infect, of course, animals like humans. And they come in all different shapes and sizes, despite this very simple, uniform, basic structure. Um, again, they're just a genome wrapped in a shell, but sometimes that shell can be like a long, skinny filament type structure, like the Ebola virus, um, which is a phylovirus, and it's called that because it has this like skinny filament shape. Many of us now are familiar with the coronavirus structure, right? It's like a spherical body with a corona of spike protein sticking up out of the protein coat. You might also be familiar with bacteriophages. These are some of the most interesting looking viruses. Um, they are specialized just to infect bacteria. Their genome can be found in this like bulb-like structure up here. And then they have like a syringe-like um, appendage almost that terminates in some feet. And it uses those feet to engage with a bacterium. And then once it has grabbed onto that bacteria, it injects its genome through that syringe and into the bacterium. So there's a lot of uh, variety to viruses, but we can actually put a number on this viral diversity that we're looking at here. So us humans, we are one species, right? And there are 263 viruses that are known to infect our one human species. So if we think of ourselves, you know, as part of this tree of life, and we are just one twig on that tree, we have a ratio of one of, one of our species to 263 species of viruses. And that ratio, one to hundreds-ish, is um, something we see even if we look at larger and larger groupings of living things. So if we now kind of expand our scope to look at the 5,500 mammalian species currently living on Earth, uh, scientists have estimated that there are 320,000 viruses to infect those 5,500 species. And so again, we see the same ratio. Um, and we see that continued if we look at larger scope at vertebrates and even at all eukaryotic life. We see that despite there's so much diversity in 8.7 million eukaryotic species currently living on Earth, nevertheless, there's more diversity in the viruses that infect them to the tune of 100 million viruses. So I guess the point of this is that we are decidedly outnumbered. As rich as our own biodiversity is, virodiversity really outmeasures us at every step of the way. Despite this diversity, viruses have a kind of universal function. They all kind of work the same. As I said earlier, they can't reproduce themselves. They need to hijack, they need to take over living cells in order to reproduce. And they all kind of do that through the same series of steps, although know that there are nuances depending on what type of virus you're looking at. So in order to get into a cell so they can hijack it and reproduce themselves, um, viruses first need to engage with a host cell, a potential cell that will take it in and replicate it. And they do that by interacting with it using the surface proteins that are expressed on their protein coats. So 
using their surface proteins, they bind to receptors on living cells. And these receptors, um, they're not virus receptors. They are um, re receptors that have a specific function in a living thing. They're a common mechanism that cells use to coordinate with each other to do their own jobs. Um, but a virus kind of hacks into them. It kind of like takes advantage of the existence of these receptors. Um, and once bound to them, it's able to gain entry into a host cell. Once inside the host cell, it sheds its coat. So now it's been reduced to just its genome. This whole manifestation of this virus particle now is just a naked genome inside a host cell. So that DNA or RNA genome, the host cell actually treats it like its own DNA or RNA. The host cell, of course, is equipped with ribosomes. It's equipped with enzymes that it goes to work. Um, and those ribosomes and enzymes go to work expressing viral proteins, making copies of the viral genome, basically making all the components needed to manufacture new virus particles. Those new virus particles come together in the host cell and then they are expelled from the host cell one way or another. Um, sometimes this is a gentle process and they kind of like leak slowly out of the host cell. Sometimes the scale of replication is so fast that they literally like explode out of the host cell, killing the, the host cell in the process. But regardless of how they leave the cell, the result is the same. They are now outside the host cell and each of these newborn virus particles can now go and find its own host cell and repeat the process. And um, because of this kind of general flow, the growth of a viral population in a body is exponential. Now, where this is happening has some impact on what happens next. If these explode out of a cell and then stay within your body, they just find other host cells in your body to infect. Maybe they exploded out of a cell, though, in your nasal epithelium. So now these virus particles are hanging out in your nose, and next time you sneeze, they can land on your family and friends and find new hosts to infect. So that's how viruses are able to spread. And I'll pause and say for a second, you know, viruses, are, as I said, are very minimal. They have very basic structures, but yet it's ingenious the way they've been able to infiltrate our own bodies and use them to their own ends. Um, so really interesting biology behind the virus. But I want to shift gears now and, and return to our lab activity, return to the test at hand today, and talk a little bit more about um, the steps to a PCR test that precede our visualization step that we're doing today. So as I said, we're just visualizing our result, but to take a few minutes to talk through these other steps, um, any PCR test begins when you take a patient sample. You take a, a sample from your patient's infected tissue. Um, where you sample from makes a difference. So if you have a respiratory illness, you need to sample respiratory tissue. Um, if you have something like the flu virus or something like the coronavirus, um, you're not gonna find those virus particles in skin cells or in nervous system cells. You need to specifically look at the respiratory tract. So for our patients today, we would have taken a swab, a nasopharyngeal swab, basically scraped the back of their throat with a Q-tip. And on that Q-tip, if that person is infected with our viruses of interest, we'll find them on the Q-tip, but there's also gonna be a lot of other stuff on that Q-tip as well. So we'll pick up plenty of the patient's own cells. We'll pick up some bacteria inevitably too. Um, we're covered at all times by bacteria, they're in and on our bodies, and so inevitably they would be on this swab as well. Now our patient might also be infected with other viruses. Uh, they might have the common cold, which we're not testing for today. But with our PCR test, we're going to be able to kind of ignore the noise in this sample and just focus in on our virus of interest, specifically by looking for its DNA or RNA. And we're going to do that using PCR, or the polymerase chain reaction. Now, PCR is a really commonly used molecular biology technique. Um, I, will I will give you a quick intro to it today. There's a lot more to know. Um, if you're interested in labs that go more in depth into PCR or giving your students a chance to actually carry out a PCR experiment on their own, we have other labs to do that. Um, but for today, we'll just conceptually kind of cover the very basic components of PCR. So generally speaking, PCR is a way that we can take a really complex sample of DNA, zoom in on just one region of interest, one sequence of interest or one gene that we want to study, and then make tons and tons of copies of it so that we can visualize it or otherwise analyze it later on. Now, for the purposes of our experiment today, that means we're taking all of the genetic content in that nasopharyngeal swab, so the patient's DNA, bacterial DNA, um, other viral 
genetics and uh, focusing in just on our virus of interest, looking just for one sequence associated with either NICV or with seasonal flu, and then making tons and tons of copies of it. So many copies that we're actually able to visualize it in our gel electrophoresis experiment. So that's PCR in a nutshell. Um, when we are using PCR to test for the presence of a virus, there's one additional consideration we need to keep in mind. Now, PCR the amplification step of PCR, where we're actually taking our um, DNA and making copies of it, that step is carried out by a DNA polymerase enzyme, an enzyme that makes copies of DNA from DNA. But as I said earlier, viral genomes can be made of DNA or RNA. So are we going to be able to use PCR to amplify viral RNA that we're interested in? And the short answer is yes, but we do need to do one additional step before we can carry out PCR. And that step is called reverse transcription. Now, reverse transcription is what it sounds like. So if you remember back that transcription is when you make a complementary strand of RNA based on a DNA template, reverse transcription is the exact opposite. So you're taking a strand of RNA and then using it to make a complementary strand of DNA. And there's an enzyme that does this. So when we're doing this with our patient samples, we're gonna take advantage of this enzyme reverse transcriptase, which is an enzyme that uh, actually is originally from viruses. It's, it's naturally expressed by many viruses. Um, and reverse transcriptase is going to read our viral RNA and make a complementary strand of DNA. We call that cDNA, stands for complementary DNA. And once we've done this, then we can do PCR as we otherwise would. So we can make many, many copies. We'll just be copying that cDNA rather than the viral RNA directly. Um, so this whole process taken together um, is called RT-PCR or reverse transcription PCR when we do an RT step followed by a PCR step. Um, and you can do this anytime you want to copy RNA. It doesn't just have to be in the viral diagnostic setting. Okay, so now at this point, we're familiar with all the steps that led up to the experiment we're doing today. Let's talk a bit about the expected results, what we'll see if patients are infected with seasonal influenza or with NICV. So if we have a patient with seasonal flu, when we do our PCR test, our test is designed to amplify, to make many copies of, um, a gene M, the sequence that is specific to seasonal influenza. Now, this gene M codes for a protein called matrix protein. It's a structural protein. And when we amplify gene M with PCR, we are specifically amplifying a 250 base pair segment of that gene M. So when we look at our gel for a patient who is positive, who's testing positive for seasonal influenza, if we load their sample into the second well of our gel, we will see a band at the 250 base pair mark if we compare to our ladder. And that's how we know that they have seasonal flu is if we see this band. And it's going to work pretty much the same if we're considering um, NICV. So our test is set up very similarly. For a patient with NICV, we will be able to amplify um, a NICV gene called HEF. HEF is a surface protein. And we're specifically amplifying with PCR a 400 base pair segment of gene HEF. So again, when we run a gel, if we put our patient sample in the second lane, we'll see a band at 400 base pairs if they're positive for NICV. Okay, let's walk through a hypothetical scenario now. So let's say we have a patient and we don't know what they're infected with. We run their sample out, second lane, and we see nothing. We get no bands whatsoever. Now, what does that mean? Well, it could be good news. It could mean that the patient doesn't have NICV, doesn't have seasonal flu, maybe they're healthy. Or it could mean that we screwed up. It could mean that our RT-PCR didn't work um, and that we're not seeing bands because of an error on our part, not because the patient's not infected. So we want to protect ourselves against that second possibility. Um, if we missed an infected patient because our PCR didn't work, that would be called a false negative. We want to make sure to avoid that, especially with an illness as deadly as NICV. We want to make sure that our negative results are really negative results because the consequences of releasing that person into the population where they can infect other people, that would be a dire consequence. So to control our experiment, to protect us against this possibility, we are going to add a control to each patient's sample. 
we're going to add a little strand of synthetic RNA to each patient sample before we do PCR. Um, this synthetic RNA is like laboratory-made, factory-made RNA. It wasn't extracted from a biological thing. Um, and we're only adding a little of it to each patient sample, so we do need to do PCR on it and amplify it in order to see it on our gel. And specifically, we'll amplify 150 base pair segment of that synthetic RNA strand. And so this band, this 150 base pair band, is one we should see for every single patient because we know for sure that we added this synthetic RNA to every single patient's sample. And if we don't see this band, that would tip us off that something is amiss. There was something wrong with our experiment and we need to repeat it and make sure we do see that band in order to really trust our result. So now I think we're ready. Let's, let's look at our results and um, let's look at them in real time first. I have a picture here we can look at, but um, so you can see our real time results. I'm gonna take this uh, imaging hood and put it over my blue gel. This is just gonna block out ambient light. And then getting my webcam ready. Oh, good, okay, great. Our results look nice. I'm gonna switch now to my webcam so you can see as well. And so sure enough, now our gel's been running for maybe 15 minutes, but we see bands in the five lanes that we loaded. We see ladder in the leftmost lane. And then we see some patient bands as well. Now, if you have a really good memory, you know what those mean already. But let's actually switch back to my slides. I ran this earlier. And um, we can look at a photo I took of my gel earlier, which looks just like this gel. And, um, and I can remind you of what each band means. So here's our ladder. Um, here's a reminder of which bands we expect to see where, depending on what our patients test for. Let's look at our first patient, patient DZ. It's patient DZ, we see two bands in her lane. We see our control band, which is good. That means our experiment worked. We can trust our result. And we see a band here at about the 400 base pair mark. And again, that is where we expect to see a band if someone is infected with NICV. So this looks like a positive result for NICV. Yikes, for patient DZ. Patient BD is our second patient. Patient BD, again, we see our control band, good. We also see a band at the 250 base pair mark, uh, which would indicate that BD is positive for seasonal flu. Patient KT, their results look the same as, as BD. We again see a 250 uh, base pair band and our control band is present. Again, this is a positive for seasonal flu. And then our patient OG, we don't see either of our virus bands, but we do see our control band. So that would indicate our experiment's working fine. This patient genuinely tested negative for both NICV and for seasonal flu. Now let's um, remind ourselves what this all means and compare this to kind of the hypotheses that we established going in. So we met patient DZ earlier in this webinar. This is the person who was on vacation from Australia. And when I looked at her symptoms, I could not tell for sure if she had NICV or if she had seasonal flu. But with my test now, my molecular test has lent me some certainty. I know now for sure she has a positive result for NICV. And as her provider, the certainty that comes with this is certainty I can act on. So now I can tell patient DZ she needs to isolate, she needs to stay away from other people so she doesn't spread the disease further. Um, and I can start to line up critical care for her because this is a severe illness and she might need um, a really serious medical care. So this should illustrate kind of the certainty that molecular tools can add to a diagnostic exercise. For patient BD, again, the, our molecular test has added some new information. This is a patient who I thought had NICV. Uh, turns out, good news, she actually tests positive not for NICV, but for seasonal influenza. Um, I guess I thought she had NICV because she had received a flu shot. I guess the flu strain that she encountered was not covered by the flu shot. Uh, that's bad news for her, but also good news that she's not infected with NICV. But again, we're seeing the value that this molecular test can add um, to kind of change my mind based on a previous diagnostic exercise. For KT, my molecular test confirms my hunch. I thought he had seasonal influenza. He does indeed have seasonal influenza. And the same is true for patient OG. I thought he had neither NICV nor seasonal influenza. Um, he doesn't have a fever. He doesn't have any of the more common symptoms. Um, but 
the interesting thing here about um, patient OG is we, we don't know what exactly he does have. All we know is that he's negative for the two viruses we tested for. So I think taken together, this set of patients that we're looking at illustrates to students both the power of molecular tests in lending certainty um, to a diagnosis, but also it, it demonstrates the limitations. So a molecular test, a PCR test is not gonna, uh, it's not a magic test that can test for every virus under the sun, right? We have to kind of pick our hypotheses going in um, and then it's possible that we'll get an inconclusive result and we would need to design other tests in order to test for other possibilities. So that concludes the core of the viral diagnostics lab. Um, I want to take a second to touch on an extension we wrote for this lab um, that can add further curricular richness if you choose to do this lab with your students. So the core lab covers some great genetic content in this medical context, um, in the context of virology and epidemiology. But our extension we wrote to kind of focus and add an evolutionary piece to this lab. Um, the core lab takes place just in a clinic, so we're just looking at our four patients. The extension takes a wider view, and we're now looking at NICV in the context of the world. Um, there are six clusters of NICV throughout the world, and our patient, patient DZ, uh, traveled to the U.S. from Australia by way of Japan, and there are clusters in each of those locations. And so students are going to play the role of disease detectives. They're going to look at actually the sequence. We're going to give them the RNA sequence of her strain of NICV, and they're going to uh, compare it to other strains isolated from other locations throughout the world to try to determine where patient DZ picked up the illness. Um, so this covers, again, evolutionary content. We look at the fact that, you know, as a virus moves through a population, it mutates. Um, and evolves. And we can use the information about mutations to kind of trace the spread of an illness. And this is a really powerful technique we've seen used recently in the case of the coronavirus investigation. Um, you might have seen this in the news. Scientists, because sequencing is so cheap now and so widely available, scientists have been able to very quickly um, sequence coronavirus strains and build a full-on phylogenetic tree um, so they fully understand how the virus evolved and spread as it moved through the human population. So again, this extension is really nice to add further richness. I think the core lab is great for an introductory biology class. Um, this extension, you could even add that into more advanced students who are capable of kind of grappling with more sophisticated biological ideas. So to summarize, um, that's our viral diagnostics lab. The thing I really love about this lab is the case study format. When I taught, my students loved any time I gave them an opportunity to kind of play doctor and role play um, and make diagnoses, and I could see them really getting into that story aspect of this lab. Um, again, this is a nice compact lab. You can do this in a day if you wish. Um, you can also add extensions to add richness and make it into more of a module to cover more biology content. Now, technically, this lab covers gel electrophoresis, but conceptually, you can stretch it to cover PCR as well. Um, and again, we're releasing this in the fall. If you um, want to be notified when we do release it, you can add yourself to our newsletter, uh, our mailing list, our, uh, and we'll send you a newsletter when it's released. Um, a link to sign up for our newsletter is in the description below this video. So I want to take a moment now and answer a few questions. Um, thank you all for submitting your questions as you signed up for the webinar. Many of them I think I addressed in the body of the talk, but there are a few I didn't, so let's uh, answer those now. So first question, how is qPCR used to test for viruses? So you might have heard of qPCR. qPCR is actually the gold standard in the United States if you're doing a PCR test, what you're actually doing uh, for, a diagnos uh, for a diagnosis is you're doing qPCR. And the main difference between qPCR and the PCR method that we use today is the degree of automation. So today, what we did was very kind of labor intensive and manual. And that's great if you're a student learning a technique you really need to step through every aspect of it to fully understand it. But QP, but if you're a um, you know, professional uh, lab tech and you have hundreds of samples to test each day, you don't want to be doing so many manual steps. So qPCR basically detects amplified DNA in an automated fashion by a machine. So it's just faster, better throughput for a professional clinical lab. Our second question how are PCR tests different from other types of viral tests? You might have heard of antigen tests. You might have heard of antibody tests. Um, oh, I'm sorry. You know, before I move on to this, there's one thing I really wanted to cover about the qPCR technique. 
qPCR is really interesting, and again, as I said, it's the gold standard for, for diagnostics in the US. Um, we have other resources you can use if you're interested in talking about qPCR with your students. We have a whole lab that really goes in depth teaching the qPCR as a method. Um, and we also have a reading, uh, our, one of our DNA DOT series focuses on qPCR. Our DNA DOTs are short readings in genetic techniques. We have one that's just solely about qPCR. The links to both of those are in the description below the video. So if you want more information about qPCR, check those out. Now back to the next question, um, how is PCR different from other types of tests? So as I said earlier, PCR tests were detecting genetic material from pathogens. These other tests, antigen and antibody tests, they're completely different. You're actually detecting the virus particles themselves or pieces of a virus particle itself. Um, so these are other molecular tests. They're used very frequently. Um, antigen tests have been used to detect coronavirus and antibody tests have been used to assess immunity to coronavirus. But again, the principle is totally different. You're not dealing with the genetics of the viruses. You're dealing with like the actual particles themselves. And then final question, how is sequencing used in viral diagnostics? Um, as I said, talking about the extension, sequencing is really valuable for epidemiologists to kind of track the spread of an illness throughout a population, but it's not really useful in diagnostics per se. Um, sequencing is still uh, relatively time and labor intensive um, and more expensive than the tests like the ones we did today, um, and it offers more information than you actually need to make a diagnosis. So to diagnose someone with coronavirus, say, you don't need to sequence the entire virus to be sure it's coronavirus. You just need to do kind of a yes or no test like the one that we did today. Um, so sequencing not really used for diagnostics, but certainly a valuable tool to track the spread of disease. And that wraps up our webinar today. I'm so glad you joined me. Uh, if you liked the tools that we used today, um, or if you liked the curriculum, there is more where that came from. We have a, a library of other labs available, so I'd encourage you to check those out. Many of those um, include PCR and electrophoresis, so if you're looking at something that is a more complete workflow, um, I would encourage you to check those labs out. Um, and thanks again for joining us. Excited to hear what you think of the Viral Diagnostics Lab once you're able to get it in your hands later this fall. Thanks for joining.